We're excited to be joined in this segment by Father Robert Lauder, who took it upon himself to see all, yes, I said all, the Best Picture nominees this year. Father Lauder, welcome to the theater. It's great to have you with us. Thanks, Stephen. Great to be here. Well, without further ado, let's get right to it. The Best Picture nominees. American Hustle. Captain Phillips. Dallas Buyers Club. Gravity. Her. Nebraska. Philomena. Twelve Years a Slave. And The Wolf of Wall Street. Well, this year there's a uh, full playing field here, a very open playing field with nine films. Um, so let's start off by talking about a couple of films that probably have less of a chance of uh, taking home Mr. Oscar. Uh, and we'll start with a film that we really haven't talked at all about tonight, um, Her, directed by Spike Jones, uh, starring Joaquin Phoenix as a man who falls in love with his computer's operating system, voiced by Scarlett Johansson. Uh, Father, I know you saw the film. What did you think about it? Well, that's a film I never would have seen if it was not for this show. Uh, but once I accepted the uh, kind of improbable, you know, impossible situation where he's talking to this machine, I must say I enjoyed the film immensely. I thought it raised some really good questions about the mystery of person indirectly. For example, I think it's very important to have a body, <laughs> to be bodily. And they make a big point that she's not bodily. Oh, absolutely. I mean, beyond the, the problematic elements of, of the relationship, which does, believe it or not, take on a, a sexual element, um, I think it does raise important and timely questions, not only about personhood, but about technology, our interaction with technology, and what Pope Benedict had written about in one of his World Day of Communication letters about how virtual relationships pose dangers to authentic interpersonal relationships. I think that those are all issues that are raised by the film, but within the world of the film, I want to sound a more cautionary note. I see this as a movie more in a post-humanist than humanist mode. I think it's a movie that's a little more optimistic about the possibility of relationships like this adding value to our lives. I don't think it's primarily a, a cautionary tale. I think it's more a movie about the possibility of finding legitimate meaning and value even in relationships with computer software. Even if those relationships don't last, they can still add to our joy and help us to grow. Yeah, I think you might be right about what the creators intended to do, and I'm not quite sure how much I read into it that wasn't there, but I found it very, I, I was, my mind was really racing when I was watching it, thinking. And, he, and, and at the beginning, he shows he's into pornography, which sets, it, sets this thing, whole thing up. He's a very lonely guy. Well, let's turn from her to another controversial film on our list, Philomena, directed by Stephen Frears, based on the true story of a young girl who conceived a child out of wedlock in 1950s Ireland, was separated from that child at the church-run home uh, where she was staying, and now, as an old lady, is uh, trying to find her missing child. Aided by an atheist journalist played by Steve Coogan. Yes, as he described himself, he's an ex-Catholic. Uh, so some of my friends think it's an anti-Catholic movie. I didn't think so because I thought every criticism that he offers of the church, she counters with the real insight into the mystery of the church. So I don't, I don't think this film is going to win, but I really like the movie. I wouldn't classify it as um, outright anti-Catholic uh, in the vein of the Magdalene Sisters, which was a, a total broadside. Um, but I think it's legitimate to say that there are anti-Catholic elements in the film. Uh, Philomena, as played by Judy Dench, uh, you know, gives as well as she takes, and she definitely knocks Coogan's character off his sort of intellectual high horse. Um, but Stephen Freer, the director, does kind of break out some of the, the typical yes. uh, brickbats that, you know, individual Catholics may be okay, if a little simple-minded, but the institutional church is wicked and repressive, and it hates sex, and it, you know, it goes on and on. I mean, the only thing worse than the nuns, the, who are duplicitous and heartless, are, are the, the gay-hating Republicans. Yeah. Uh, I found the character Judy Dench in some ways was very simple, but whenever she had to talk about her religion, there was a kind of a wisdom there. She really met him head on, I think, several times in the movie. I, I tend to agree a little bit with both of you. I can certainly see where the elements of concern are coming from, from some of my friends who also find it to be uh, very anti-Catholic. Um, I don't find it to be that way myself. I, I think that Intellectually, the filmmakers probably tend to agree uh, more with the Steve Coogan character, but I think that their hearts recognize that uh, Philomena is onto something that Coogan's character doesn't have. And yeah, right. there's, there's a kind of a, a shallowness and a glibness to the Coogan character, and I think that Philomena comes off as more of a real human being, and I think that her... Uh, her faith is definitely part of that. The one concern that I do have about the film is around the charge that the 
church was selling these orphans. This is something that the nuns have apparently protested didn't happen, and I would need to know what more of the history is to know how accurate or distorted the movie might be on that score. Yeah, I don't think the movie's going to win, but I, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if Judy Dench won. I yeah, mean, she, well, and this she, is a great, great actress. I, I think they both work. The chemistry is great yeah. together, and, and I love her charge at the end that really sort of puts Christian forgiveness front and center in a way that kind of confounds the secular-minded atheist. Mm -hmm. he, he just doesn't understand the power of, of right. forgiveness and mercy. Mm -hmm. Moving on to another somewhat controversial film is Dallas Buyers Club uh, with uh, Matthew McConaughey uh, really getting most of the buzz for his, his performance as a, a real-life um, Texas uh, rodeo hand. Uh, uh, his name is um, Ron Woodruff. Ron Woodruff. Um, who uh, contracts HIV positive. He's kind of living a promiscuous lifestyle. Um, and he opens up a black market shop selling illegal uh, medications that were not approved yet by the FDA. Um, Father Lord, your thoughts on this film? Yeah, I like the film very much. Uh, I didn't know Matthew McConaughey was this kind of an actor. I think he's tremendous in it. It holds your attention completely. I had a little difficulty with the female doctor as a character. It, she, I, I couldn't, well, I liked her. I couldn't believe I didn't find it believable that she would relate this way to, any, to the, the patient. But in general, I thought the film was very powerful. And it gets you to empathize with all sorts of people you might never meet in real life. What I thought was interesting about the film is the way that it changes over the course of the story. It's, it's very abrasive and hard to watch, I think, in the first half hour or so. Uh, but as it goes on, uh, it becomes a more human film, a more humane film. Um, the, the character kind of softens and, and you know, becomes... Uh, more of a relatable character, and by the end, it's become about something even larger than empathy. It's become uh, a meditation on, on mortality and on how death really uh, uh, equalizes all of us and, and levels us in a very profound oh, way. Oh, absolutely. It's about empathy. It's about mortality, but it's also about just, I think, uh, compassion, particularly for those suffering, the dispossessed, the marginalized, much more than I think it's about some sort of endorsement of homosexuality. I think it's more endorsing just the inherent dignity of them as human beings. But on the other hand, there is more than a tacit approval of the gay lifestyle throughout the film, uh, not to mention just the promiscuous lifestyle in general, uh, gay, you know, gay or straight. Our next film is uh, much less controversial and much better known to our viewers. Uh, we've already talked about it on this show, Captain Phillips, uh, directed by Paul Greengrass and starring Tom Hanks. Uh, David and I both thought it was brilliant, so Father Lauder, let's hear your I say. I have to agree with that. I thought it was a very, very exciting movie, and I had a strange experience. And I don't want to ruin the movie for anyone who hasn't seen it, but as I was watching it, I was certain that a certain character would die. Right to, up to the last half hour of the movie, and then suddenly I thought, wait a minute, is this based on that news story I remember? And then it turned out that it was, you know, I was wrong. But even when I thought I knew it, it was exciting, and then when I discovered I was wrong, I still found it exciting. And one of the ways it, it works is, I think, the, there are close-ups all through the movie. I don't think the camera's more than a foot away from anybody's face. So we're in the boat with Tom Hanks trying to figure out what would I do so it's, it was a terrific film. Really yeah, terrific. you know, it, I think I could draw parallels between this film and last year's Argo, where both films were based on real events. You knew how it was going to end, but you're still on the edge of your seat the whole film. Um, and, uh, you know, speaking of empathy with Dallas Buyers Club, this film also, I think Paul Greengrass does a great job of empathizing, not justifying the actions of the pirates, right. but at least empathizing and not demonizing them. Um, and I think it speaks to what you had brought up during the summer season about the role of empathy even in the spiritual life. I think what Greengrass does better than any director out there is to combine the elements of thriller and procedural and to do it in a context of human beings. And, yes. and the fact that he humanizes uh, the, the crew of the ship as well as the pirates, I think, is a, is a tremendous achievement. Yeah, in a movie like this, to get you to be... To have some understanding of the pirates is quite an accomplishment because they are so frightening at the beginning. You say, well, what are they going to do? They're desperate. This is, you know, they, they've got nothing to lose. Let's talk about the movie Nebraska, uh, the story of a uh, young man dealing with his aging father's attempts to uh, deal with his mortality and, and, in particular, his desire to leave some kind of legacy to his, his son, uh, a, a desire that takes him uh, a, somewhat off the rails and yes, out of the way. Yeah. I would say of the nine films, I, I, I have my favorite. This is not my favorite, but I think this is an exceptional film. Uh, very subtle, 
very funny at times. And of course, Bruce Dern does a great job. I mean, for every day does a great job. They were so good, several times I wondered if they were actors. You know, I knew Bruce Dern was, but I didn't know anybody else in the movie. And I thought, I wonder if they went to Nebraska and got a group of people. Did they, they are all, they're all professionals, I guess, aren't they in the movie? Well, Will Forte, who's probably best known for his comedic work on Saturday Night Live, does a wonderful job as the son. He brings a real genuineness and warmth to the role. Uh, you know, experiencing this kind of on a personal level of dealing with an, an aging father myself, it really moved me. Um, and, and like you said, it's, it's, it's dealing with a very serious subject matter, uh, but it's leavened with humor. And yes. I think to be able to find humor uh, in those, those difficult times of life, uh, it, and it's done so well. Yeah, I think when they finally connect with very simple acts of kindness to one another, it's very believable. And I think that it's really that connection between the two of them uh, at the climax of the film that is, for me, the most moving and powerful part of the film. That, that last scene is an act that is about kindness and it's about dignity, but it's also about filial piety. Uh, about the son's desire to honor his father right. uh, in spite of everything. Right. And I think of um, the verse in Sirach where it says, uh, even if your father's mind fail him, him, grieve him not all the days of his life. Um, I struggle with the films of Alexander Payne. Uh, at many times I find him to be uh, somewhat contemptuous of his characters, particularly in a lot of cases, the supporting characters. I definitely felt that to be the case here in the whole small town. There wasn't really anybody uh, who doesn't turn out to be a loser or a drunk or something well, there's worse. Well, the, there's the woman who works in the, in the newspaper. There's the old girlfriend. She's the only and I, one. And I would think that this film both at the same time critiques but also celebrates small town values. I mean, I think the whole relationship between the father and the son is the quintessential idea of a family staying together uh, that's, that's missing, I think, in, in sort of larger urban settings. I'm a little more cynical about it. <laughs> well, I guess we should get this one out of the way. Let's do Wolf of Wall Street next. Uh, Father, um, I can't believe I'm asking you this, but what did you think? I thought I was in a sewer. <laughs> I, I didn't like the film at all. I, I think Scorsese has tremendous talent, but his, his basic attitude seems to be more is always better. The film is much too long, and I think we could get by with one orgy. We didn't need nine or ten. So I really dislike the film, and uh, I just I didn't like almost nothing about it. I liked. Yeah, I mean, I don't uh, necessarily buy the, the the charge that he's somehow trying to say greed is good, mm -hmm. but he's not saying it's bad. I think he's just putting it up there and, and asking viewers to decide. And. Um, you know, I, I think, as you said, I think less would have been much more. I think in critiquing excess, he's guilty of excess himself. I think in several of his films, several of his he just could, he doesn't stop. You know, we got, we got it, and then he just goes on. You know who used to do that? Cassavetes, John Cassavetes. He felt he needed a good editor. You know, I have to admit that I enjoyed parts of The Wolf of Wall Street much more than I thought I would. I went in with dread and trepidation, and to a significant degree, the movie did confirm that. I respect the arguments of some of my friends who say this movie is really celebrating, not critiquing. I don't agree. Yes, I can agree that this is a cautionary tale. Yes, it's a morality tale. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure I need all that much morality in my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, let's turn to the three films that are really the front runners. Uh, three films have garnered more Oscar nominations than any others, including uh, the top awards, uh, the top nominations for Best Picture, uh, Best Director, and in most or all cases, Best Screenplay or Best Editing, both of which are crucial nominees. Um, and let's start with American Hustle. Yeah, American Hustle is a lot of parallels between that and Wolf of Wall Street. They're both sort of critiquing uh, American excess. They both deal with these sort of uh, sleazy, seedy milieus. Um, but where I, I can tip my cap to Leonardo DiCaprio, he gave a strong, committed performance. I don't think anyone in that film was likable or sympathetic. Um, whereas in American Hustle, I felt that Christian Bale's character uh, was all those things. Father, what did you think? Yeah, I think if I had to bet on what film, it's not my favorite film, but if I had to bet this would be the film, I think this one is going to win. I thought it was great ensemble acting, and I thought it was a very clever plot. It, it kind of plot, you, you had to stay right on top of it to figure out what was the next twist, you know? So I think it's a really well-made film. And Amy Adams, I think, is one terrific actress. For those viewers who haven't seen it, uh, the movie uh, directed by David O. Russell, uh, based loosely on the, uh, the famous abscam uh, scandal in the 1970s, involves a, a pair of sort of grifters in the 70s, uh, Christian Bale and his, and his uh, sidekick played by Amy Adams, and how they get involved in this whole scandal involving, you know, crooked May Jersey mayors, FBI agents, and, and 
uh, mafiosi. But, uh, you know, I think all the characters in the film exist in a moral gray zone. Uh, nobody is admirable. I think they're all trying to make the right decisions. They all just make really bad choices. But as Christian Bale says, he, he, you know, he's trying to survive. Um, and, and I think it does, you know, raise some interesting, uh, you know, ideas, particularly late in the film, where he starts getting at least a spark of a moral awareness yes. and conscience. And I think that's what's so missing in the Scorsese film. And, and what brings that out in him is his relationship with Jeremy Renner's mayor. And that, to me, is the moral heart of the film. That's the one part of the film that really did speak to me. In general, yeah. this film's not really my thing. It kind of left me cool. But the way that Renner's character awakened that moral sensibility in Christian Bale's character, that I thought was really interesting and compelling. And also there are a number of very funny lines in it. Father, I think you're right. I think American Hustle is a very good chance of winning uh, if 12 Years a Slave doesn't win. Uh, Gravity, of course, is also considered to be one of the front runners. American Hustle and Gravity both have 10 nominations. Uh, 12 Years a Slave only has nine. Uh, but 12 Years a Slave has that crucial uh, screenplay nomination along with American Hustle. Gravity's screenplay by Jonas Cuaron, um, the son of Alfonso Cuaron, understandably was not nominated. Um, so it's probably got less of a shot, but it's still a great film. Let's talk about Gravity. Yeah. Well, Gravity, I'm, I'm sure it's a cinch to win cinematography. If anything else wins cinematography, I'll be amazed. But I thought the human element uh, didn't work for me. I thought Sandra Bullock was, did a very nice job of acting, but it looked to me like they had this tremendous uh, work of technology, and then we've got to get you know some human element, and they kind of sh shoved it in there. So it, it didn't involve me at all. But I spent most of the movie thinking, how did they? Do, how do they do this? How do they? How do they well, film I, this thing? I, I I would disagree. Gravity was probably my favorite film of the year. Uh, to me, it just brought back everything that I love about movies: the the, the visual spectacle of it, but also the human element. Uh, you know, as I said on the show when we reviewed the film, the quote that always comes to mind is Manuel Kant, where he said, two things fill me with awe: the starry sky above and the moral law within." And I think this film touches on both of those magnificently. Um, I think you're right. I think the, the, the way that they would honor the film maybe is to give Alfonso Cuaron the director Oscar and, and that way they would feel like they could give it its due and then decide between the other two for the, the top prize. Yeah, I think it's a shame that probably if that, the Academy follows that logic, which I think is probably going to be the case, that um, Steve McQueen will not be the first black director to win uh, the Best Director Award. Um, I think his movie probably has uh, the best chance of winning. My, my money is on 12 Years a Slave. I hope 12 Years a Slave wins. I agree with you, Father, uh, regarding the characterization and the dialogue and gravity. I think it's a little flat. It's a little bit... Um, uh, Hollywood stereotyped. Uh, for me, the power of the film comes from the images and from the themes and from the, the isolation of space and the magnificence of the way that it captures that sort of vertigo of stepping out into that, that void and, and the total isolation and the sense of not having any idea where your bearings are. But And I can't think of another film, at least recently, you know, we've come so used to screening films on our TVs at home, even our stamp size, you know, mobile devices, that finally a film that demands that you leave your house and go see it in a theater, and not only in a theater, but in IMAX and 3D. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it really was spectacular. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, except for Wolf of Wall Street, uh, I enjoyed all the other films, but I think 12 Years as a Slave is in a league by its own. I mean, this is a great, great movie, I think. So I, I hope that does win. Um, I, I liked everything about it. A number of my friends are not going to see it because they've heard it's too violent. I, I, it was violent. But I didn't think it was too violent. I, th I mean, I think it's okay. It fits into the plot. Well, as, as one critic said, you know, between Gravity and, and 12 Years a Slave, 12 Years a Slave is the film that has the gravity. Um, it is the, the historic and, and socially important film. So I, I would say as much as I would like Gravity to win, um, I have no problem. Uh, 12 Years a Slave is, is a masterpiece. It's not only is the violence part of in, integral to the plot, but I think it's also, and this is what's really key, it's integral to the characterization. A lot of people have compared the scourging scene in 12 Years a Slave to the scourging scene in Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. I am a huge fan of The Passion of the Christ, and I will defend the scourging scene and all the violence in The Passion of the Christ, but at the end of the day, the scourging in The Passion is about how much Jesus can endure. What Steve McQueen does in 12 Years a Slave is he pushes Chiwetel Ejiofor's character, Solomon Northup, how much violence are you willing to inflict? Mm. Because um, um, 
he's he's ordered to do it or else his his master will do it and that's going to be yes. much worse and yet there's still a limit beyond which he can't push himself well i was watching the film and i went with about 10 people to see this movie a number of us said they kept we kept thinking of nazism you know to to uh, kill six million jews the nazis had to convince people jews are not people and at one point in the movie one guy says this this isn't these aren't people this is my property i can do anything i want well, this film is, uh, you know, you can draw the parallels that this is the Schindler's List of, uh, you know, the, the, the tragedy of slavery in our country. It really is, you know, to think that this is the first film that deals with slavery with a slave as the protagonist. And that's where it really goes even beyond Schindler's List, because as wonderful a film as Schindler's List is, the Jews are kind of in the background. They're in the margins. The story centers on a German character. Now, that background is extremely important in Schindler's List, but it's to... seen through Schindler's eyes, not the people who are actually experiencing the Holocaust. Yes, and, and giving Solomon Northup the dignity of making him the protagonist in this film, I think that that is a towering achievement which is going to stand uh, for a long time. I hope I'm wrong. I hope more films come along that do this. Certainly there's an opportunity. I would love to see um, movies made about people like uh, Harriet Tubman and uh, Frederick Douglass uh, if, if Hollywood's up to the challenge. I, you know, I have to say before we move on that I think really the, the, the stamp of the film that stayed with me, speaking about how much being, being pushed to how much violence he can inflict, at the very moment when he would be most justified to inflict violence, when he's freed at the end, um, there, there's no malice. Yes. He walks off with his dignity um, uh, with, without any thought of, of inflicting any more violence. He, he's experienced it so much that I think he's had his fill of violence. Well, and what that really does, I think, is it deprives the viewer of that kind of vicarious satisfaction. Yes. This movie offers no satisfaction. Yes, that's a he, good point. Yeah. He goes yeah. back to his family, but there's no revenge. And that's such a, an integral theme in Hollywood today. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, yeah. And at the end, once again, I hate to move, ruin the movie for anybody, but the, the way his family welcomes him back. Twelve years, has, they haven't seen one another. It's very, it's really deeply touching. And I think I have to say, since we're talking about Best Picture, not only is the, the themes and the story itself so powerful, but it's a beautiful film to watch. You never think you'd say that, a beautiful film about slavery, mm -hmm. but it is a visually magnificent film as well. And that very visual beauty only serves to underscore the oppressiveness of the circumstances. It parallels sequences in the novel, the actual novel by Solomon Northup, in which he talks about the birds in the trees and how, when he sees them, you know, just the beauty of their song, but all it fills him with is desire to fly back home to his children. Yeah, get away. Well, while we're speaking about best pictures, uh, one of the best pictures from last year's Academy Awards and one of my favorite films of last year, um, Les Miserables, will be the closing night film at your upcoming film festival. That's Can you right. talk about That's that, right. Father? Yeah, we have six good films. We have The Mortal Storm. I don't know whether either of you remember it. Well, you don't remember it, but maybe you've seen it on TV. The Mortal Storm, Margaret Sullivan, James Stewart, Robert Young, and Frank Morgan, The Rise of Nazism in Germany. And Metro Golden may have made it, before we were in the war, which took a certain amount of courage. But even, and they never mentioned the word Jew in the film, they never mentioned the word Nazi. But still, uh, the German market closed. They would not show any more MGM movies. Anyway, that's the first one. Then we have 12 O'Clock High, which is a great war film. Then we have a French film, The Chorus, in which a man tries to deal with juvenile delinquents through music, through forming a choir. And then we have Guess Who's Coming to Dennis, Sidney Poitier, and Tracy and Hepburn. Uh, so it's a pretty good festival. Um, I'm getting about 80, 90 people. Um, I just, I'm, I'm glad we can do this, spread the word about it on the show. Sure, happy to do that. Um, before we close the segment, uh, of the nominated films for Best Picture, your favorite, Father? Uh, 12 Years as a Slave is my favorite. I'm yeah. gonna go with Father. I'll be the odd man out here, and while I absolutely love that film, I'm gonna go with Gravity. Which is number three to my number two of 12 Years a Slave, so we're not that far off. <laughs> 